everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Pensado's Place. The Super Bowl is just over as we tape this, and our guest has worked on Super Bowls, this year's presidential inauguration, and a whole lot more. You're going to enjoy meeting him. But first, a lot of you who are watching this don't have representation, and now you might not need to. Our friends at BAMPAY have come up with a great tool called Project Link. Project Link, you can put your bio in, use it to market and brand yourself on all your social media platforms like Instagram, SoundCloud, Facebook. Generate leads for yourself. Once the leads are generated, you can utilize that same Project Link to negotiate terms, set up your project, and administrate it all the way through. A one-stop solution, and I think that's a great idea. It's very easy to get. All you have to do is sign up at pensadosplace.tv forward slash project hyphen link, and you're good to go. Rush over there, check it out, market and brand yourself, generate leads, generate pay. Good stuff. Um, also, we want to give a quick shout out to a great friend of ours, the president of Exchange, Ray Williams. They just passed 1.1 million transactions. That's all the software that's used in the business. Um, it's pretty incredible. Um, they have over 11,000 products. It's in 68 countries and quite a milestone for a guy who loves our business, has done our thing. We were one of the first people to recognize Exchange on the last Pensado Awards, which was Pensado Awards 4. Uh, Ray, we're proud of you. You're a brother. You're a Canadian. I am too. Good job, man. Congrats to Exchange and that whole team and Ray Williams. Um, quick note. Next week, Al Schmidt with his first plug-in ever. Dave's going to have a conversation with him and the creators of that plug-in and Al himself. You want to tune in for that. Hit us up on our socials. You know them all. Like and subscribe. Click notify if you would. And now, the, one of the talents that literally has blown Dave and I away, enjoy our conversation with the very gifted, very giving, Kevin Teasley. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Honor to be here. Uh, Kevin, how you doing, buddy? I'm it's doing a, great. How are you? It's ben, an honor to have you. Um, oh, thank you. Let's let's do a little. Here's what I like to start out doing. There's so many different things you do. I like to throw something at you that you've done, mm -hmm. and then you give us back what it was like, what you went through, and so on and so forth. So, speaking of the Super Bowl, sure, you worked on last last year's Super Bowl. What was the experience? What did they have you do? Give us the vibe. Yes. Uh, first and foremost, it was really a surreal moment. Uh, almost like when you hear the players talk about it, there are very few events that uh, feel like the Super Bowl, the grandeur of it, the, just the scope of it. Um, so when we worked on that, it was, um, you know, a lot of moving parts, almost more than any tour or any TV show, or anything I've ever done, because uh, I worked with the JLo camp. Uh, she's one of my main clients and uh, uh, superstars that I'm so fortunate to work with. And we co-build that with Shakira. Wow. Um, so you had uh, Jennifer Lopez, uh, her, her creative team and music team. You had the Shakira creative team and music team. And then you had the overall Super Bowl music direction wow. and creative team. Wow. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so it was a lot of moving parts. And for that one, um, the, the overarching music director on that show was Adam Blackstone, an amazing uh, music director. And so we would build the, the, uh, the J-Lo show and pass it over to him. We would have the creative conversations back and forth. Shakira would turn her things in and there was performances done between the two. So that was probably um, maybe a month of conceptual, two months of pre-production, and wow. then uh, a, a month of rehearsal and then almost a month on the ground in Miami when we did the Super Bowl, it was in Miami. Um, yeah. So it was almost a four to five month process of, you know, pulling that all together from the pyro teams to the video wall teams, the choreo teams, the, uh, the actual broadcast team, the camera people. 
it's just a lot of moving parts. Uh, I learned a lot from it. That was my first Super Bowl, and I hope it's not my last. Yeah. But that was my first one. It's almost like fatherhood. They say nothing prepares you for fatherhood until you have your own children. <laughs> nothing prepares you for the Super Bowl until you do it. You know, so yeah. it was a lot of learning and things like that. But it was uh, one of the toughest, but definitely a bucket list uh, experience for me. The um, the um, the people that we've had on the past, we've had a couple of folks who've done large events and the level of collaboration and sort of governmental intervention. There's a number of ch- of chiefs. They all got to be satisfied. There's broadcast standards. There's, yes. there's so many things that have to be put into place to make it happen. I'll tell you what is very similar to, we had a lady on who runs the audio for NASA. Mm. And when they had their big launch, I think it was called SpaceX, it, she described the same process. Months of rehearsal, months of preparing, months of this, that, and the other. And, and oftentimes our, our audience sometimes doesn't know the depth of this, of what goes into and the kind of c- collaboration you have to have. <clears throat> Both tolerant, you have to be tolerant. Um, you still have to be creative. You have to protect your artists and, and so on and so forth. It, it's an undertaking. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's um, it's it's the it's a beautiful balance uh, between collaboration and friendly competition, and uh-huh. and and that's what makes everyone great. You know, iron sharpens iron. You know, you have the Shakira camp. We'll joke with each other. They're going, oh, we have something for you, and then we'll <laughs> see them the next day. Oh, we have something for you. So there's that friendly competition, and there's also that collaboration because. You know, everyone at the end of the day, you want to put on art, you want to put on a great show and you want it to be consistent. And that's the one of the tricky things about when you were saying the collaboration is it's like listening to an album when you have a bunch of different producers and a bunch of different mixers. You still want to try to have something that keeps it consistent. You know, uh, when you have a show that big, there's a lot of musical contributors, a lot of producers on board, there's music directors on board. But as best you can you want the arc of the show to be pretty consistent you know so there is that working back and forth of you know some of Shakira's music might have been more 808 heavy and Jennifer's legacy catalog isn't so much so you try to find that balance so that there's a you know a nice through line through everything right of all the hats you wear and you wear quite a few from um from film trailers to fit films to working with major artists and stuff, Mm -hmm. which hat gives you uh, the most satisfaction when you're done that you wear? Yeah. um, What's a little bit of the difference between those? Yeah. uh, When I, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm wearing the music director hat, it's kind of like being a composer, but in real time, you know, you're putting on a movie, but it's a concert. And I like that aspect of it because I'm not always playing when I'm a music director. I'm, But when you're putting on concerts these days, you're like a you're a music producer, you're a music director. You might be in the band. You're a sound designer. You're a uh, executive, so to speak, of your department. So I really do like that part um, of it and the excitement. Nothing uh, almost like, you know, a sporting event. Nothing ever uh, meets that excitement when you start a concert or a tour and you hear the crowd go off and you hear your work or your contribution to that tour. So that's that's that rush, so to speak. (laughs) Um, the, the film and TV stuff with doing trailers and things like that, that's just always been a love of mine. You know, I'm, I, I I think I'm a, you know, my degree is in jazz piano. So I I just think that it always speaks to my musician and my composition background. Um, and so I, I really enjoy that. Um, and then quite honestly, the, 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 the mixing part of the concerts and the technical part actually just came as I, on my journey here in uh, in LA, you know, I didn't go to school for engineering or things like that. It just came from, you know, being the fly on the wall and, you know, studying and knowing what I wanted to hear in my work. But um, th- they're all three different types of rushes. And quite honestly, I don't, I can't pick one or the other. I like the balance of all of them um, so that I'm able to, you know, feed, you know, all of my creative, you know, uh, wants, so to speak. Mm-hmm. How was the um, how was the inauguration? That was probably more surreal than the Super Bowl. Um, it was 
not as many moving parts, so to speak, as a Super Bowl with all the different camps because you just worked with your camp. Um, but it was the um, taking anyone's political affiliations out of the background, uh, out, out of the story. I was just honored to, to serve my country that way in, in yes. some way and to be a part of such a, a, a peaceful transfer of power. Um, and with everything that's going on in our country, um, whether you're a Republican or Democrat or Trump or Biden, I just was honored to do something for the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's something that I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. Um, unlike the Super Bowl, uh, that's every year. There's only an inauguration every four years. Mm -hmm. So, um, to be able to do that, um, and to do it with an artist like Jennifer, which was groundbreaking in and of itself. Yeah. Um, was just uh, amazing. I, I, I was in awe walking through the buildings. I have, I'm from Virginia, so I remember going to the Capitol when I was a kid, like in the fifth grade. Yeah. But I, really, you know, just to walk through it with an adult eye and going through the Capitol and see like this is where things happen in America um, was quite, you know, awe inspiring. So yeah. um, just to be there, like literally, I would just go, wow, I'm here, <laughs> and, you know, at the inauguration. And, and let me ask you a question. So n not only did you walk through the Capitol at an inflection point in our history after what happened to the Capitol on January 6th, that's amazing in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, but are you doing something musical while you're there? Are you, or while you're there, is that rehearsal? Is it the actual performance? Is yes. Okay. Uh, when you, for most performances like that, whether it's Super Bowl or inauguration, once you uh, get there, it's mainly just, polishing the, the car it's Got polishing it. the performance you've done a lot of pre-production you've done ton of rehearsals we liaise with the marine corps band and did some recording with them um you know and some collaborations with them um by the time you get to events like that as we all know whether it's the grammys oscars whatever um there's very little rehearsal time once you get there yes. you know um so you know we did a lot of pre-production but when we're there my head at that point is um, a lot of, believe it or not, um, artist relations at that point. At that sure. point, I'm there to really serve Jennifer yeah. um, and be there for her yeah. um, and kind of be the liaison between the music and the technical, making sure she's comfortable mm -hmm. dealing with the broadcast trucks and things like that or the the, the front of house guys and, and gals just to make sure that the performance goes off uh, flawlessly. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of, you know, 20 hour days, you know, in, in Red yeah. Bulls and go in before that part. <laughs> it feels to me, uh, Kevin, that like in, in my world, I walk into my studio and I just mix a record. Um, it seems to me that your enjoyment comes as much from the technolo techno technological part of what you do. And then also the, um, the interaction with lots of people and that sort of thing. And then the music is, let's don't use the word secondary, but but you really enjoy the, the the part, like to hear you describe all the different mechanisms that are competing with each other, and and uh, I'm doing too much of this. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yes, I, and and the reason I can do that, and uh, is because a lot of the times I'm getting assets from amazing artists and amazing mix engineers like yourself. So the music part is kind of you know, what we do since we were kids, you know, we've all picked up an instrument yeah. or mixed yeah. since we were kids. And yeah. so a lot of the times I'm, you know, getting assets from the world's best engineers. So if I'm getting, you know, the 808 stem from the record you mix, I don't have to try to make it right. It's, it's already right. Uh, I'm just yeah. massaging it for live, you know, or we might yeah. add some extra production, you uh, know, um, you know, just to, to sidetrack that, that, answer a little bit because a lot of times what I do in that where I get to have fun is that you know there is a different aesthetic when you're I don't want to call it remixing for live but rebalancing things or reimagining oh, the yeah. record for live um you know I'll bring up the musical elements all the harmonic elements more than it would be on a record for oh, live okay. so I'll dig into your stems and pull out a delay throw that might be some ear candy that might get buried in the music but for live I'll push it up if uh I'll bring down the drums a little bit for a TV show because the broadcast compressor, you know, like this is all very fun to me, you know, because I'm working, I'm so fortunate to work with such 
amazing material, amazing artists, amazing producers and mix engineers that uh, that it makes I can focus on the technical because the music's already great. You know, let me let me do a personal aside just really quickly. One, tell Jennifer she did a phenomenal job with the night. I will. I will. Thank yeah, you. She did. And then tell Benny Medina that yeah. Jennifer should that first we said hello and that Jennifer should come on the show and just Absolutely. shut the world. Um and uh she should come on with you. <clears throat> so she's comfortable and we can have a creative discussion. Absolutely. That'd be fun. Uh it'd be amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So so now part of part of what I think is also interesting about your story for our audience specifically is that you didn't do the Berkeleys, you didn't do the Blackbird Academies, you didn't do the full sales. No. You're an HBCU brother who did his thing. Tell us, tell us yes, about yes. that story. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and to that, and thank you for bringing up that up, her, because that's really important to me. I love all the our beautiful institutions, Berkeley and you know, North Texas and you know, uh NYU and all these wonderful places for music. Um to that story, I didn't move to L.A. until I was 30 years old, almost 31. So I kind of moved what some people might say is late in the game. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm just a country boy from Virginia. And uh, I'm from a town about 30 miles south of Richmond, Virginia. That's the main town mm -hmm. um, called Hopewell. Um, very humble beginnings, raised by my grandmother in a small little, you know, uh, house. Um, uh I'm uh, a mixed person, uh, half black, half white. So um, but my grandmother's African-American. She raised me. So I kind of grew I grew up in that culture and we came from very humble beginnings. And I went to um, uh, HBCU for those of the listeners that don't know that stands for historically black colleges and universities. Yeah. And I went to Virginia Union University, where some of the baddest cats that you probably never heard of have taught and played there. Yeah. Um, and, and to me, um, you know, yes, you do have some, I want to say, uh, maybe access and um, financial advantages of going to a, a school like Berkeley, where you can have Jacob Collier come in and do a master class, or you can have Went Marcellus come in. We weren't able to have that. But what we did have was heart and drive and support of each other. Um, and that's what I think is important that you don't, you know, I don't want people to feel like if you didn't go to those schools or you're not from New York or you're not from LA, you can be from, a little small town in Virginia come to LA mm -hmm. and put in a lot of, you know, blood, sweat and tears and a lot of 10,000 hours, maybe 50,000 hours for me at this point. Um, and you can still achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. Um, so I think that's really important um, that, you know, don't feel like if you don't go to these schools um, or academies that you don't have a, a fighting chance. And, and you also failed to mention one thing about that journey that people who have a similar journey can look up to. Uh, <clears throat> it's a dude named Kevin Teasley. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I hope so. I hope by the time it's all said and done, I'm no, really no. big on the education part um, because as we talked before her, you know, Ricky Miner was one of my first mentors when I came to town, who's yeah. a legend. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he's, he's very tough yeah. on you. And I appreciate yeah. looking back how tough he was on me because he wasn't going to let me slack. And gotcha. I'm, the, I'm the same way. I'm like, I'm, it's tough love with the young people that come in to work with me because I owe it to them to like, when they meet Dave Pensado and they meet her, they can go, well, Kevin prepared me to be able to be Dave's assistant. He, I, I know what to do, you know? So I think it's very important that we put that information back and also don't just share your successes, sh share your failures, the mistakes I made when I came here because I didn't know, because Excellent. People need to hear that you that we're all human and you made a mistake. And it's not about the mistake. It's the correction of the course afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think it's very important. Wow. I uh, I have a question just for me. So um, if anyone wants to take a bathroom break, this would be a good time. <laughs> um, why are trailers... Why do they have different music than the movies? Is that to, is that to save money? I, that kind of annoys me. The great question, I, I, that question gets actually asked a lot. The reason why it used, unless it's a franchise movie and like a Star Wars where there's a canon of music or whether it's Superman from the John, you know, the, 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 uh, the very uh, 
iconic music. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, trailers, the teasers will go out sometimes for a big tentpole movie, like an Avengers or something like that, mm-hmm. 18 months before the release date of the movie, mm-hmm. which means they're still shooting, which means uh-huh. there is no score. Uh-huh. The trailers actually come out, start to appear one year to six months, the theatrical trailers. The TV okay. spots can come on between six months to, you know, um, Release you know uh, leading up to it. A lot of the times the music just hasn't been scored yet. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And, and then the music, it's, uh, the film itself hasn't been completed. And a lot of times it's still in post. So what they do is they go to whether it's a music library, a composer or record company, um, and they'll source out or license the music for the trailer. Um which is a, a business model that uh, I feel a lot of artists and composers should continue to explore. But that's yeah. why it's that way. Again, unless it's a, uh, you know, a, a movie that's like a uh, has its own universe, like an Avengers Superman or something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and another one, while everybody's getting back from the restroom, uh, <laughs> are, are live strings dead? Live strings? Yeah. No, they they aren't. They're they're very much alive, um, especially. For those big movies, if you're John Williams and Hans Zimmer and things like that, it's definitely alive. Um, you know, um, when Herb and I had the first conversation, I always tell people I'll be honest. It may not always be what people want to hear, but I do owe it to be honest. Um, some of the string dates are being done outside of Hollywood in mm-hmm. other cities, you know, in other countries. So yeah. that's the way people are getting them done. Um, and and or it's a lot with what I do a lot, especially for pop acts. It's a mixture of the MIDI samples, amazing MIDI, you know, like Spitfire and center mm-hmm. samples and things like that, with a blend of a smaller orchestra mm-hmm. to help the budget. So it might be a MIDI mock-up of 80-piece orchestra, but you're adding maybe 12 strings to it and maybe overdubbing them and things like that. Um, for, for us, strings and vocals a lot of times has a lot of sag after union things you have to deal with and reuse fees and yeah. things like that. So it can get a little tricky. Yeah. Um, so either you do, you know, a dark date or a buyout or you go to other cities and other uh, countries personally, um, because I live here and if I lived in another city, I would feel the same way about that city. I want to call as many of my friends in my community as I possibly can. So instead of going to another city or a country and spending the same amount of money and getting 60 players, I'd rather spend the same money and get 10 players here in LA because that's my community. Mm -hmm. Um, And I try to make it work that way. Mm -hmm. Um, Great great answer. Wow. Thank you. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, Kevin, you got, you got a problem. Um, (laughs) <laughs> uh, I'm I'm personally vested into the industry needs to know more about you and I'm oh thank you brother thank you I'm I'm personally going to make that you have I already made an education commitment to you but but I got some I got some other stuff brewing yes um, sir I, and and I tell you what why this is important for our audience responsibility accountability uh, transparency honesty. It, if that's part of your musical journey, your music is going to be better. Absolutely. And, and so you want to glom on to people who who do that and not like Kevin, and not a lot of people do that. I would humbly submit that that may be some of the success that our show has had because Dave and I are just telling it what it is. I mean, you you can you can look at Dave's hair and know that he's just telling <laughs> it. So uh uh but but the good day, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You look great. You look great, brother. You look great. Yeah, that, that poof, <laughs> that poof on this side is really well. Funny. It comes from a comes. My hair comes from a culture. That that's yeah. for sure. That's for sure. It's the woodland. Absolutely. It's the woodland hills culture. Oh, that's where <laughs> I live, woodland hills. There you go. <laughs> but 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 the fun part um, for me, just as a fan, mm-hmm. is to listen to somebody who at my crusty age inspires me. I learned something from um, your approach to it is, is this kind of combination of analog and digital. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the best of the older stuff and, and process and discipline and truth and, and enough of the technological leaning forward stuff that it creates almost a new way of going, man. It is, it is, 
it, I was inspired by our phone conversation, our Zoom yeah. conversation and this too. So now you've got all this going, your artist side, you're doing a bunch of stuff. You're working with superstars. As you look at Kevin moving forward, what are you excited about? What's on the table? Where are you going? Absolutely. Um, the beautiful thing about life is if you would have asked me that question two years ago, it would be a different answer than what I would tell you today. And I'm very proud to be 50 this October and I have a four-year-old son. And all of us that have kids know your perspective on life changes. changes. And I, as I'm becoming to the, as the young bucks call me, I'm in that OG realm, so to speak now, then yep. uh, is that I really want to be, um, I, I want to open the, the the tent, so to speak, more. Yeah. I want to start, um, especially to, to all people. I don't, I don't care, but especially to a lot of the minority groups that um, maybe just don't have the access, you know, to be able to, you know, know where to even go to start composing for trailers. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how you know, um, where to even go to start music directing? How do they meet an artist? And there's a difference between being cool and good. Would you rather be cool or would you rather be good? If you're good at what you do, you're going to be cool. Love if you're cool, <laughs> you know, you know, watch what you put on Instagram. You know, the, yeah. the selfies with your shirt off might be cool, but am I going to want to hire you to do the inauguration with me or yeah. to work with a certain artist? It's those sorts of, you know, things that you do learn as you go. So yeah. we're when we're moving into United, um, we're going to be starting more of a, I don't want to say the word education because, um, I, I want to bring more young people in to to work with us and just see that they um, making hit records is great. Scoring a film is great, but they can all kind of live in the same universe, you know, um, that they can as they're as they're, you know, pursuing their artist career. Well, if it takes, you know, or their writer career, you know, and Dave knows this also well, so many great beat writers and songwriters it may take you 20 sessions or two years to finally get that song placed. But during that two years, you've made 50 pieces of music that we could be licensing for a TV show, a reality yeah. show, or That's put right. it in a commercial, things like that. It's mm -hmm. just so much talent that, you know, just instilling some more. And this is something I learned from Ricky uh, directly. It's just being more, instead of just being a musician or a, or a composer or something, and like what you guys do, just being more of a, look at yourself more of a, as a brand. And yeah. not in the cool hip way, but a true sense of a brand yeah. as a company, you know, yeah. and helping people along that way. So hopefully um, the next five years at United, we're bringing more people in and, you know, just getting them more involved. You're you're in trouble because I'm telling I hope you, so. the minute you move in United, I got you. Yes, I, sir. Ooh, yes, sir. Boy, you have, boy, oh boy. Yeah, um, I can't wait. We're I'm excited. So what the audience doesn't know also is that oftentimes when we book these guests, um, they have gatekeepers and people that represent them and stuff that our team works with. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Carrie from, from Kevin's team is dynamic and incredible. amazing. And, amazing. and sometimes, and, and what's important about that, if you get to the point in your career where you have a team or any kind of representative, you have to choose wisely, match carefully and make sure everything is mission critical it's a they're an extension of you they, they they really do need to be an extension of you and yes. share your philosophies and you know share your ethic and really be an extension of your spirit so to speak yeah um you, you may not necessarily expect your business manager or your accountant to be as funny or as affable as other people on your team but right. if you if, if you are a person that believes in paying people right and paying them on time, you have to have them share that same ethic, you know, or paying people a, a fair wage and not trying to get, you know, everything has to be an extension of how you think as yeah. opposed to trying to make them think the way you think yeah. you want to, the universe will just bring you people that, you know, that gravitates towards that. You, you got big Kevin, stuff. I'm going to ask you kind of an unfair question, but um, I, I know you can do this for me. Um, in today's world, um, not so much specific, but what is what is the biggest opportunity out there? Would it be sinking? Would it be uh, um, any of the various forms of, of, of monetizing your, your skills and money? And um, a, a quick hint of a, of a you don't have to be specific, but but a way to a way to get into that world. Sink is a is is a really good source of income. 
Um, it's, it, it is a world of the big. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. A sync is um, when you're syncing your music to a visual or another medium, whether it's for a radio, even if it's on a radio station or an ad, that's still syncing, which is the term licensing and syncing are kind of interchangeable. But sync came from syncing the music to a visual picture. Yeah. Um, as we know, there's more channels on our uh, cable box than less these days. There's more channels on YouTube. Everything's um, needing music. Um, that's a huge opportunity there. But with huge opportunity also comes a huge hurdle. And what we're fans of, the term I use is the race to the bottom. Mm. Is what you see, uh, and this is not an editorial on any company that may um, subscribe to these theories. We just don't do it. And we wish, and it's not just in sync, it's musicians and our community as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, there is such thing as competitive pricing. If you're charging 10,000 and I charge 8750, that's competitive. But if the worth <laughs> of what you're doing is 10,000 and I'm charging 2000 mm -hmm. and it's just as good, we're racing to the bottom that then brings your value down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so it's the community keeping the value of music up. Anyone with a laptop can make decent sounding music, especially if you really know what you're doing. Uh -huh. But sync is a, is a good source of income, but you can't, you're not going to retire um, and, and get that third home in, 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 in the Caribbean off of 12 cues. You really have to say, I have hundreds of cues because it's like publishing. It's a business of breadcrumbs. Yeah. So if this cue, when you get your royalty statement, you might see $10 for that cue because it was used on CBS this morning. $50 for this cue because it was on ESPN. But at the end of that quarter, if you have hundreds of cues, thousands of cues, that will add up to a pretty nice chunk at the at, at the end of that quarter. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I see a lot of people that want to do it. They go, I, I want to get into the licensing business. And I'm an artist, but they only have 10 songs. You know, you can be the next person in that iPhone commercial and make, you know, $300,000 on a license. But there's a lot of people that, that are competing for that, including Billie Eilish's people, her publisher. So you're right. competing with a lot. So you have to just make sure that um, you put a lot of music into it and it's quality music. I read, I, to not contradict myself, I'd rather for you to have 50 cues that sound good and 300 of them and only 50 of them sound good. You okay. know what I mean? That's And the other thing is um, for me with trailers and sync, you have to be a fan of it. And just like music and you hear the, a lot of the hip hop people say it too. Don't do it just for money, do it for the love of it. And then the money will come. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a nerd. Every Monday I go to Apple trailers and I watch all the new trailers. I watch every single one and I go, Oh, I love that cue. That kicked my butt. That sounds great. And I'll watch the other one and go, oh, that one, not so much. Oh, I, I don't like that one, but that seems to be a trend. This is going on. So we really watch them every Monday and see what they're doing for romantic comedies and see what they're doing for big tent poles. But if, if you're just doing it to say, throw someone my music, put it in a TV show, you might not get that much success as opposed to you, you watch Keeping Up with the Kardashians and you see what kind of music they use. And then you're supplying that type of music. Hmm. I've noticed that that there are companies that that advertise that they'll help you sync or you 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 sign. Are those? Uh, don't give me a a, a a concrete answer, but is that one viable way to go? That is a viable way to go, <clears throat> and they all have different structures. It could be a straight admin deal, and they they place it and they take a percentage. Um, some of them want non-exclusive for a period. Uh, uh, yeah, and they want to split the publishing or they take a piece of the sync, um, the upfront sync fee, if there's one available. Some companies are exclusive and they just they want it for three years. And, you know, whether they place it or not, um, it's with them because it does take time to do it. So there is a, a bunch of different options out there. And to be quite honest, I've from moving here at 30 to now at almost 50, I've done them all. You know, I've, I've, I, 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 there's pros and cons with all of them. Um, you know, um, but that's yeah. up to each individual to decide what's the best one for them, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So educating yourself is vital and, and just about every creative effort. <coughs> and, and, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we all, <coughs> in all our creative endeavors, we stand on the shoulders of a lot of big people, you know. Yeah. And you're always just a phone call away from as you continue in the industry, wherever you are, especially in today now when we live in social media where you're uh, you know, a, a, a DM away from contacting someone, yeah. ask one of your friends, a colleague to say, hey, when you did this deal with 
um, such and such a company, what were the terms, you know, and, and they'll, you know, you may not ask them how much money did you make, you know, but you can still say, Hey, did you feel that it was worth it? Or did you like the, the deal? Or did you end up going with another company? Um, I'm an open book. I'll, I'll, I'll tell people, you know, anything they want to ask me, I'll tell them it's ultimately it's up for them to decide, but I think it's good to do your research. You know, um, even before in the past, what I would do if I had, let's say a hundred cues, I might put 25 cues with one company, 25 cues with another company and 25 with an, and so forth. And then at the end of maybe two years, I would look back and say, which one worked? All things being equal. Like I wouldn't give 25 hip hop cues to one company and 25 rock to another because it's hard to do the analytics that way. Yeah. But if I gave about the same types of genres of cues to each company, I can kind of look and go, oh, people are really liking the, uh, you know, the dramatic cues like you would hear in Survivor. I'm getting a lot of placements with that or, you know, things like that. Or they can't get enough of urban hip hop. Like I need to do more, you, you know, but you but you have to have that vision board, so to speak, to be able to do the analytics at the end of a substantial term. You can't just change, uh, do make a decision after three months. You have to do it for a year to 18 months to really see if that's working for you. What I didn't do, um, which I would advise people, is unless they're licensing a ton of it, if I was working with one of the the libraries and they had a ton of urban music, I didn't give them more urban music. I gave them something that they didn't have to yeah, see yeah. because then I was competing with thousands of other hip hop tracks when I, they really need to be having, you know, rock tracks. So I would always kind of do my research um, on stuff like that. Well, not, not only that, uh, what's important about what you're saying is one education is collaborative and you want to find collaborative people to learn from. If somebody is resistant to that, that's not where you go to for education. You might get something else there. Correct. And, 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 and then the, the, the second part is that life also, and particularly in creative endeavors, it's about a strategy you have to approach things with a strategy. If you don't have a strategy, you might have churn, but you're just churning and you're just doing stuff and nothing's happening. You're not really going anyplace. And before you find out, you're actually slipping backwards and you don't know it because you're busy. Absolutely. There's two, two terms that I really love and I forget why I read them. It might have been in some negotiation class, which Pepperdine University here in LA does a really good class on it, but wherever you get it, all musicians should take a negotiation class yes. um, just to understand the psychology of negotiation. And one of them is they call it the, the battleship philosophy. Every time you played that game from when we were young, where B9 and try to sink the battleship, no one ever really sinks the battleship on the first shot, but right. you have to be taking an educated guess of where that ship may be. It's always the second, third, and you start narrowing it down. Yes. Which goes in, which goes into the the other end of it, which is paralysis by over analysis. Absolutely, look at somebody, but like Tom Brady, he has 0.7 seconds to make a decision of where to throw the ball on the field, or he's going to get pummeled. Yeah. So you do have you your brain is like any other muscle in your body. You learn to exercise it to make decisions, and if it's not the sink your battleship decision, almost. Every success I've ever had in life was never my plan A. It's always been B, C, or D. Yeah. You know, it, it's yeah. never been plan A. Yeah. Um, you know, so um, it's really having that strategy and a team of people around you. Um, like I think I read from Bill Gates. He always goes into a room and says, I have a great idea. Talk me out of it. So yeah. I want people around me not to be haters, but my team that like try to shoot holes in my plan to show me what I'm missing, you yep. know, um, and that's why you have them around you. Very, very, very similar. Now yeah. let, we got to um, we got to see this batter's box thing. This country okay. from Virginia, he knows um, you know lots of great talent comes from there. Lots of great athletic yeah. talent for a, absolutely. So, uh, Dave, you ready to fire it up? Well, he is my friend, but I'm gonna clean his clock this time. I can feel it. <laughs> All right, cool. Let's let's fire up batter's it, it, box. It, it could be a learning experience, you know, done the right way. Yeah. All right, here we go. Okay. Uh, your favorite piece of hardware? Uh, my uh, Better Maker Limiter right now. Mm. Wow. Samples? Uh, Spitfire for orchestral. Deadlines? 
two days before they're due. <laughs> Distortion. Uh, my overstayer MAS for coloration. Wow, you use distortion really well, by the way. Yeah. Quincy, uh, Quincy Jones. M- one of my idols. Virtual synthesizers. Um, I like Vengeance. Drum machines. Uh, I use machine uh, a lot with uh, tons of samples I've collected over the years. Immersive, I can't say this, immersive audio. I'm not as hip to it as I should be. Technology. I'm addicted to it. <laughs> yeah, aren't we all? Yeah. Uh, major or minor key? Um, minor. Everybody's saying minor. Me too. Me too. Yeah. My mom I guess it's the minor. times we're in. <laughs> my mom liked minor keys. That was the first yeah. time I learned to play on the guitar. <laughs> yeah. um, what's, a, what's an inexpensive, <clears throat> excuse me, what's an inexpensive piece of equipment uh, that you've used on a successful record? The most oh wow! Yes, um, relatively inexpensive, under a thousand dollars. I bought a used uh, Moog Sub Thirty Seven that I love. Wow, I love it. It's like, of course, the go-to for R and B for synth, uh, synth bass, and things like that. Yeah, can't beat the moves. Yeah, man, my friend, great job, great job. Thank Virginia. you. It's Virginia. it's an honor to be here. It's like. Uh, uh, Carrie said, uh, you know, I'm noticing a little pep in your step. I'm like, I'm getting no, I'm on Pensado's place. <laughs> you, <laughs> you can't tell me nothing today. I mean, it's an yeah. honor. I watch you guys and, you know, Dave, you're a, you're a legend and Herb, you're a legend too, brother. So to, for you guys and what I told Herb on the, when we talked is that what I, what everyone loves about the show, there's no pretense. There is no <laughs> false humbleness. I'm and, and if people knew that most people in the industry are people like us, it's the, it's the, the minority that are the jerks or the mean people or they're yes. feeling themselves. Most people in our community are really open people, reachable people. And it's great that you guys are like the tent pole to show that you can be legends and pe- and just be regular cats. So it's, it's really important to me. That is probably <clears throat> as high a compliment as we could ever receive. Oh. <laughs> uh, and, well, and, and honestly, we are, you know, 500 some odd episodes in of weekly adrenaline and inspiration for the most part from people who we probably would never have met. Right. Doing amazing things. And the notion that we can play some role of inspiration or some role of expanding that is, I am still, after all those episodes, blown away that people feel that way and also inspired, you know, you're a grinder, I'm a grinder. Um, right. And, and for grinders, we want to keep changing the paradigm, keep pushing the envelope. Um, Absolutely. It, it, it's my definition. You know what I'm saying? And for so, sure. Um, you absolutely see now when I get off this thing and get through my board meeting, I got to go kill and do some Kevin Teasley shit. That's right. <laughs> and then, that's right. And then I'm coming back to you with some, with some stuff. And we absolutely, Oh yeah. We're going to change. We're going to change lives. You know, I, I was, um, I'm close to a guy named Quentin Gilkey that we have on the show who works with Dr. Dre. And sometimes mm-hmm. he will share with me these very specific conversations he's had with very influential people. Um, and a lot of what he is getting are people who are giants and they're, they, what they're concerned about now is their legacy. And they Absolutely. want to make sure their legacy stands. And I, I feel exactly the same way. And I've been busy working on that for a number of years. And I'm happy the way it turns out. But it turns out that way because we get to meet people like you. So as much as we inspire you, you inspire certainly us back. And um, I think that your future in this game, I think that you are going to be writing rules, setting standards. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. People. No, no, man. I, I can't believe. And like I said, Carrie is the one who introduced me and was so pro. Um, I was helpless once I oh. I'm a man too. And once I read her and I and I peeped her game and how she rolled, it absolutely represents the way you roll. So she's back I'm, there I'm, uh blushing you. right now. She's back is there she really? blushing. She's well, going Carrie. Her, her. Black, people, <laughs> black people can't blush, but <laughs> blushing too. Um Man, I am so honored to meet you. Um, honored to meet you guys, too. And we got a whole lot more to do. So, Dave, P, take us home. One of the things that I've noticed is 
the generosity with which the top people in the industry and in their industry come on the show and, and just make me feel inadequate for not doing more to help and share information and stuff. And by the way, good Lord, it is high. Um, I think it was Quincy Jones heard that said, if, if, if you want to get something, you first have to open your hand and give something to receive something or else you can't receive it. Correct. And I, yeah. think, I think that's a metaphor for, for, Kevin and, and all of the people that we've had on the show that, that, that like to share. And sharing is not giving up your ideas. It's not necessarily giving your techniques to anybody. There's not a human being on earth, literally, that can do what Kevin does. There's not, right. there's not, a, there's not a, a human being on earth that can do what Herb does. That uniqueness is never going to be emulated. It can be emulated, but never like... Of course. Yeah, whatever the verb is. Um, and so, guys, even even at any level you're at in, in, in a particular creative field, um, use the technique of, of giving some, something back to receive something. There's a lot of there's a lot of videos on, on on YouTube with people that don't have a lot of experience, but they're sharing something. They're sharing what they learned, and, and I support that 100. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we'll see you guys next week. Mm-hmm.